Welcome to Smart Business Show. Uh, today, we're going to talk to Liston Witherill, and we talk a lot about um, sales, your sales flow, and cold email, actually, the way he does it, which I've never advised cold email, um, and I guess what I do is a lot more research intensive, as you'll hear in the show, uh, than the cold email he suggests that he does uh, as well. Um, but it's interesting for sure and he's got a good technique so don't use drip for this because it will kill your deliverability uh, and they'll get mad at you and then how do you find the right workshops or ways to speak Um, he was saying that you need eight touches to follow up with the client before they uh, are really ready to buy a lot of the time I've actually found that very true recently to follow with a two-year follow-up for a client and now we have uh, like a middle five-figure project after following up for two years which is really good uh, and then also how to we talked a little bit about um, the barriers that can come up and making sure you're talk, talking to the purchaser. So it's a great show and it was great to talk to Liston. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Spark Business Show and today we are talking to Liston and Liston is uh, runs GoodFunnel.co uh, and he helps freelancers with their sales and uh, their marketing strategy. So did I miss anything there? No, you got it. You got it. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Curtis. So today we're going to focus on sales. Um, and what is the biggest mistake you see that freelancers or consultants make with their sales strategy? Um, I see, I'd say two biggest mistakes. Number one is actually three biggest mistakes. Number one is they're selling to the wrong people. So I often hear I can't charge enough. And then the next thing I hear is the number one objection I get is the person has absolutely no money to spend on anything. Mm. It's like, all right, maybe that's not the right person. Um, the second biggest thing is definitely not enough follow up and no system to track the follow up. Uh, something like a third of sales come after the seventh, um, contact, right? So you're going to need to continue to follow up with people. It's not because they don't love you or they don't think your work is amazing. It's because they're busy and they have a million other things going on and now might not be the right time. Um, And then the last thing is not setting up the sale properly. So not having foresight into what the future barriers are going to be, not building value from the very beginning. And that's a little bit more of a complicated topic, but that's what I see when people are complaining about, you know, not being able to charge enough or or, um, not attracting the right people. Part of the issue is they're not setting up the sale properly. Uh, And so we can talk about that as well. So let's start with how do you find the right people to sell to? Yeah, well, you know, one thing I would reference definitely is uh, you had Philip Morgan on and he talked about positioning. Mm. And I th- I think being able to attract people through your marketing, the content you write, whatever you're doing for marketing, um, based on a unique position in the market uh, allows you to kind of pull in leads. There's also a push function too, though right? You may want to go and do some sort of outbound. One thing that we've done recently that I've seen as successful is cold email campaigns, whereby I'm creating large lists. um, I'm automatically sending out contact to them. Uh, Another thing to do is just be in the right places. So um, I actually did a webinar with Philip recently Mm -hmm. on teaching in real life. And so if you're at the right conference workshop teaching place, you're very likely going to have a bunch of people with their butts in the seats that could uh, consume your services, right? And you just need to make sure that it's targeted enough. So I think the key to finding the right people is first deciding on who the right people are. Mm. Um, That's the prerequisite. Uh, And then from there, figuring out where do those people look for information, where do they look to solve their problems um, and be in those places. So you said something that I find interesting is that cold email is good or can be good because uh-huh. I have never found that and maybe that's just because I'm doing it wrong. So can you give me a little, tell us a little bit about how it, you can make it work or worth your time? Sure. Um, I'm actually, before I answer that question okay. and I, I will tell you the whole system, but um, just out of curiosity, <laughs> mm-hmm. What have you done in the past that you found didn't work for you? Because it probably mirrors what a lot of people listening to this have done. Um, what I would often do is I'd find a site that was not, <coughs> excuse me, that didn't look good, that I felt I could help. Um, sometimes it was some 
even a site I used, right? So I'm a big cyclist and I found a site that had just a bunch of problems in their e-commerce store. And I found that as I made the order, so I sent them in and then I said, hey, like we should talk maybe about helping you out with this because these are problems and they're losing you sales and most people are never going to tell you about it. Uh, mm-hmm. And they said, thank you very much. And they did give me a discount for an entire year, but that's as far as it went. Um, and I've done a few around that. I generally put some research into it. If I see um, a place that looks mm-hmm. useful where I could be helpful and I put some research in, right? I look, I maybe look at their, say their podcasts or anything else they're doing and just see how it all fits together and, and then send them sure. an email that way. But they have never heard of me typically before. Right. And so by definition, that would be cold email. Mm-hmm. Now, the one thing I would say is what you're describing is um, quite a bit more research intensive than I would definitely than I would normally recommend, hmm. and so if I were you, you know I think the like, back to follow up right number the biggest mistake is people don't email enough. Hmm. So my advice would be to email about eight times and continue to follow up until you get a response. In your case, um, what I recommend is a, a call to action that's very similar to what you did, where I would say something like. Hey, I was on your site. Love what you're doing. Um, I have about 10 or 15 minutes of feedback that I think would help you increase your conversions right away. When can you talk? Yep. So the the call to action is never, um, would you be interested? Because mm. they can say no to that. Yep. <laughs> and they're probably not that interested. Um, it's It's not soft or squishy. It's very clear. Like, when can we set up a time to talk? Or when can I... You know, when can we set this appointment? And so I'm going in for the kill right off. Yeah, yeah. And you're also removing uh, some of the value from the email and putting it in a face, more of a face-to-face or voice meeting, which is a higher trust velocity as well, right? So just because they've talked to you and heard your mannerisms, they have more trust in you initially. Well, for me, right. And it depends on your business model, I think. If people sell a lot of productized services that are cheap, say under $1,000, then maybe they just don't want to even talk to someone. But for me in my sales process, average lifetime value of one of my clients is say, I don't know, $10,000, yeah. right? So I definitely want to get them on the phone and mm-hmm. take over the process as soon as possible. So you know, what I find works really well is getting larger lists, hundreds of people who match the profile of the person that I'm looking for, And then I'll email them eight times and that all happens automatically. And so I don't see anything back until they reply. I either get a bounce, I'm out of the office, Mm -hmm. can't talk, take me off your list, something like that. Or, yeah, this looks interesting, let's set up a time to talk. And that that conversion happens somewhere in the range of 3 to 5%. And so where do you get these lists from? Um, I make them. Um, there's lots of tools out there. Uh, probably the best one that's on the expensive side is called Clearbit. Um, clearbit.com, and it integrates with, obviously, enterprise like Marketo or Salesforce. But it also integrates with Google Sheets, um, where you can just create lists by clicking a few things and telling it what type of people you're looking for. How big is the company? How would you describe the company? Things like that. Um, the other I'd say probably the best, but it's a little bit slower, is prospecting on LinkedIn. So figuring out, like, the reason I like prospecting on LinkedIn is I can tell it, I want a company between 20 and 100 people, and I want it to be in these cities, and I want it to be in this industry, and I want everybody in the search to have this title or this keyword in their title. And then I just go through and I have a tool, prospect.io, where I can scrape 20 contacts at a time and it's automatically going out and finding their email address mm-hmm. um, and then I just dump that whole list into email software and what do you use for that uh, not drip um, <laughs> please do not use your broadcast email service to do this because you're going to burn your domain um, mm-hmm. so the best the best practice is to open up a new domain that's similar to yours um, connect a google account and then I use something called Blue Tick, which is done by Mike Tabor from Startups from the Rest of Us, which is um, a you know, perfectly good way to do it. And so you can build a sequence in there, and it'll tell you how many people are in there, and it'll drip them out at a rate of, say, 40 contacts a day or whatever you want. Yeah, so you're saying with drip, you're just going <laughs> to get such high unsubscribes and other stuff or people annoyed that it will drip will be mad at you, right? 
yes, it will hurt your deliverability and they'll kick you off. Okay. <laughs> That's essentially what will happen yeah, yeah. if you use Drip or MailChimp or fill in the blank for any yeah, yeah. email service provider. You also talked about finding the right workshops um, with your clients. How do you go about finding those? Teaching workshops? Yeah, teaching workshops or conferences, right? Yeah. Um, well, uh, there's a few different ways. I think for me, the best way has been to figure out um, there, there's kind of like the push and pull, right? So the push is what are the types of workshops that I want to be at and to teach? Um, and so I'm looking at, you know, in my industry, in these keywords, because I'm niched down on messaging and conversion optimization, it's pretty easy to figure out where those people are. Um, also, there's a city where that happens, which is a benefit that I have that maybe some other people don't. But San Francisco has tons of these things happening all the time. Um, and so, you know, figure out what are those options and then just connect with the planners. The one dirty little see a placement, attention, um, being on a podcast, whatever it is, is um, people need content from you. And so if you can provide content, then they're, you know, at least willing to have a conversation with you about finding what you can do. Um, this, the other thing I did was I taught at uh, a regular class at General Assembly, which is a place where people go to learn. And so I proposed to them, hey, you don't have any class on this topic. Um, what if I created all the content? How does that work? And they said, yeah, that sounds great. Create it and we'll give you half of the money that we make. Mm -hmm. They do all the marketing. I go and teach. Um, and then the nice thing about doing these workshops is, as you, I'm sure you've told your audience, it allows you to now repurpose that content, record a video, and put it on your website. Mm -hmm. and now you have another lead magnet. Yep. Yeah, I do actually start every book I write is usually at least 10 blog posts. And if I feel like I didn't cover it good enough, then I have a book. If I don't, then I have the starting of a book even, right? So I right. repurpose it into a book. And if it's done after 10, I think, well, maybe it wasn't a book yet. <laughs> <clears throat> so for following up with customers, you said, or I guess prospects, you said you recommended eight, um, eight emails. What about for the warm leads? Because you recommended, what was it, Blue Tick um, for the cold leads. What about for warm leads, people who have come to you? What do you use for that? Yeah, so there's um, a few CRMs I would recommend, but it, you know, to me, it's important which tool you use, and it's more important that you actually use it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I personally use Streak CRM. Were you going to say something? Nope. Okay. Yeah, I personally use Streak CRM, and the reason I like that is I live in my Gmail inbox, and it lives there too. And so basically, anytime I have someone filling out a form on my website or emailing me directly because they found me on some other site where I'm listed as a person to contact. Um, then I create a deal in my CRM and I continue to follow up until I mm. get a yes or a no. Yep. And so I, I have people in there who I've emailed 30 times over the course of six or eight months. Mm. Um, they haven't told me to get lost, but they also haven't said, they want a project or they don't want a project. Mm -hmm. Ideally, I'd push them to make a decision much faster than that. Um, I would say on average to close a deal, it's going to take between emails and phone calls, um, I would guess that it's going to take about eight to 10 touches. Mm -hmm. So that is very easy to lose track of if you don't have some system to do it. Um, so I recommend streak. I also recommend pipe drive is excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted something that I could use in my inbox. I've actually followed <laughs> up with a client for two years who just finally said yes for like a middle six for middle five figure project. So it was, absolutely, oh, that's awesome. it was absolutely worth, you know, high touch at the beginning and then moved into like every couple months emailing and saying, Hey, what's up. And then when they indicated they're a little more interested getting back into a higher touch mode again. It was nice once that came up, it was very quick to like go through the deal after two years of you know, following up. Yeah, and between um, the manual follow-ups mm -hmm. like you would do out of your sales system or you know, email blasts that we send at least once a week, 
what I find is if I'm getting in touch with people and they need my services, they're like, oh, thank you, mm. right? Like they're, they're glad because they actually need your help. And so, you know, one, one big takeaway I would have for anybody listening to this is that you have something of value for other people. Um, and so don't hesitate to continue to follow up. Yeah. Because it may just not be the right time. They may have other priorities. Maybe they just had a kid. Who knows yeah. what's going on with them? Yeah. Um, so it's it's definitely something that you should continue to do until you're told it's it's no longer something they want. Yeah, and that lead actually went cold on me. I would, like didn't respond to probably two of the emails, and then came back and was like, "It's been super busy. We had a factory burn down. We had this happen, and I just had other things to do. Thanks for following up." It's like you're welcome because it was mostly yeah. automated, right? The name would come up and I'd click a button. I use contactually. I'd click a button mm -hmm. and it would populate the email for me. I basically hit send, right? And that was all I did. Um, so it was good. So yeah. Go ahead. at the beginning, you also talked about setting up the sale properly. Can you tell me more about that? How do you set up the sale properly? Yeah, so I think... Um, part of setting up the sale properly comes back to your positioning. So you need to be on message about who you are or why you're different. Um, I think also th that I'm a big believer in this notion that we teach people how to treat us, mm. right? So if you, you feel desperate or second guess yourself um, or you're hedging during the phone call, each of those things starts to diminish your value. Mm -hmm. in the eyes of your client. Um, and so, you know, I think it's important to say, I'm, in a, I'm a professional, I have something good to offer you. And also, I think by setting up expectations properly, you also need to understand <clears throat> what is the value to the client, right? Why are they doing this project? Why you and not someone else? Um, what have they done in the past? These kinds of questions start to paint a picture about how badly they need you. And often, I think what you'll find, and this is scary in the beginning the first time you do it, but what you'll find is you're going to tell a lot of people, you know what, this isn't a fit. Mm. I'm sorry, right? Yep. Um, either your budget is too low or now isn't the right time and here are the three steps you should take before you, you talk to me or someone. Whatever it is, I, I think you'll find that you can disqualify a lot. But what I mean by setting it up properly is communicating your value early on, um, delivering on the expectations they set, time, these kinds of things are part of how they make decisions. Um, and, and then also understanding the value because that's going to directly correlate with their perception of what you're worth to them. So what percentage of leads do you say no to, do you figure? Well, it depends where they're from. Not all leads are created equal. Yeah. So word of mouth and referral leads um, are usually much, much, much better. Mm -hmm. um, I would say hmm, the more we get, the more we say no to. I'd say about 40 to 50% now. I just turn away. Yep. Yeah. What about you? Uh, my referral leads are really high. Um, I may... I might turn away 10% of those and I am listed as a recommended developer on a number of the tools I use. So those ones I turn away a much higher percentage because I just look I at see. it and I think, I look at it initially, I'm like, okay, you're, this just isn't a good fit at all. Or it might not be the type of project I'm even interested in. So I may just refer it away to someone else instead. Um, yeah. When I get a lead, we're, we're listed in different websites where we get referral traffic similar to you. And mm -hmm. what I find is a lot of those folks will reach out and say, Hey, can you do a project for X dollars? Yeah. And I'll always say no, because I think if price is their number one yeah. consideration, they, they're not going to hire me. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and don't, I don't want to work for them. That's right. <laughs> and I certainly might make it a, like in my initial calls, I'll be like, there's someone cheaper out there. You know that, right? Or why would you do it? Why would you do it a different way? I think Jonathan Stark has a whole series of questions. He walks people through about like, Basically, don't 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 use me. It's a bad idea. Right. Yeah, so. I'm a big believer in that too. Mm -hmm. As am I. Um, you also talked about losing a sale because you weren't aware of the barriers that would come up. Um, how do you find those barriers? That's a million dollar question. Um, <laughs> the so I would say number one is always record them 
as mm-hmm. you're having these conversations and a new objection comes up for the first time, you should have a document that says, you know, sales objections and you just list them out. But for almost all of us, you know, in in services, one objection is going to be something related to price. One objection will be something related to value, which means you didn't do your job setting up the sale properly. Mm -hmm. Um, One of them will be related to timing. Uh, One of them will be related to, you know, I'm not the right person or I don't have the authority to make this and, you know, so-and-so isn't on board or they're too busy right now, all these kinds of things. Um, So write them out. Um, The other thing you can do is just ask people. This is what I do whenever I lose a deal, I'll say, hey, it really helps me build my business. Um, if you, like, no hard feelings, I won't get mad, I'm not going to try to convince you that you made a mistake. Um, would you just tell me, uh, you know, why did you decide to go with someone else? Um, and that'll tell you a lot. Yep. Yep. I always find too, if they say, well, I'm not really the decision maker on this or anything. Part of my process initially is that I ask who the decision makers are. And if they won't get on the phone, like the CEO will not get on the phone with me even once, that is not an important enough project. I just say no to it. So I Exactly. To, yeah. That's a giant red flag. Yeah. I don't have to yep. talk to them the whole project. If they want their marketing person to run it, that's fine. But there's so often I find that the CEO and say the marketing person have two diametrically opposed ideas of what the value is and what the budget is. There's lots of times when it's been like, oh, marketing person's like, oh, 15 grand. And the CEO's like, we have $1,000 for this. That's it. And the marketing person's like, what? How? We can't do it like that. I didn't know that. Right, exactly. And you know at any point the CEO can pull the rug right from under you. So yeah. you want to make sure that they're they're believing in the project. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I mm-hmm. will not continue with a project if I don't get to talk to them. I just say, that's it. I can't do it anymore. And to varying degrees of frustration, which doesn't bother me really. I just, whatever. <laughs> so is there anything else that we should know about having a good sales process as consultants or freelancers? Um, I'm sure there's a million other things you should know, but I think that's all we have time for. Um, the, the one big thing I'd leave people with is to sell to the right person, right? Don't, don't try to turn a lead that's willing to pay $100 when it should cost them $10,000 yeah. into a client. That's the losing battle. Mm-hmm. And then the second thing is to follow up, follow up, follow up. Have a system for that, um, and you will see more sales coming in. Awesome. And where can people find you? So they can find me at goodfunnel.co. We have lots of resources to help you about messaging. But if you're looking for information on how to say the right things and become a a better salesman along with being a freelancer consultant, you can go to my website, listinwitherall.com. And all these links will be in the show notes. Perfect. And what else are you going to say? No, that's it. Awesome. Thanks for joining us today. Listen. Thanks for having me.